Well, today we continue our sermon series on the book of Jeremiah entitled Exile and Hope. Now, the first uh, several chapters of Nehemiah, as we covered the first half of this book, if you've been reading the book of Jeremiah or if you've been participating in the sermons, you know that the first several weeks are rather morbid because Jeremiah is just like saying, you guys are not living up and we've been doing this wrong and that wrong and God's gonna bring judgment if you don't repent. And of course the people didn't wanna repent because they didn't think they had anything wrong with their lives. And so the first 28 chapters, quite frankly, can be a little bit of a grind. It can be repetitive, it can be a bit morbid because so much of it is dark. It's about destruction, it's about judgment, it's about punishment, it's about the need for repentance, it's about the hardness of the people's hearts. But a couple of weeks ago, we finally began to see a change in the book of Nehemiah. When you get to chapter number 29, we read Jeremiah's writing to the first set of exiles who have already been taken back to Babylon, and he writes them a message, and he says, God knows the plans he has for you, not to harm you, but to bless you and prosper you and to give you a future and a hope. So settle in, make the most of your exile, build houses, pray and seek the peace of Babylon and let God work in you. And then last week we looked at chapters 30 and 31 and 32 where Jeremiah begins to record specific promises that God gave the people. So even though they are going into exile, even though they are going to be removed from their homeland, even though they're losing their jobs, even though people have died, the Lord says, I'm gonna bring you back to the land. And Israel and Jerusalem is once again going to flourish and prosper. And I'm going to send a Messiah and I'm gonna give you a new covenant. In the middle of these chapters of hope, chapter 29, 30, 31, 33, there's this one little chapter, number 32. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. In chapter number 32, the Lord tells Jeremiah right in the middle of all these messages about hope, the Lord tells Jeremiah to go and to buy a piece of land. And this property that Jeremiah was supposed to buy was only days away from being utterly and completely useless. Imagine if someone came to you and there's a category five hurricane coming through the Gulf of of Mexico and they know exactly where it's gonna hit and they say, hey, I've got a building, I've got a piece of property I wanna sell you. I don't have any insurance, but would you wanna buy this at its appraised value? And you say, well, sure, I'll buy it, knowing that a hurricane's gonna roll through and not be very valuable. Or if someone had a very expensive property in the California and a forest fire is coming, they say, would you like to buy my property at its full face value, even though there's no insurance and it's almost inevitable a fire is gonna destroy it all? It's that kind of foolishness that God asked Jeremiah to step into. Jeremiah, I want you to buy a piece of land, even though in a short period of time, it's going to be utterly useless and of no value. That's why I've entitled this message, The Dumbest Purchase Ever. But all of us have our stories of dumb purchases, don't we? This week I posted on my Facebook page and asked people the question, what is some of the dumbest things you ever purchased? Over 200 responses I got to my Facebook page. Some common responses, of course, revolved around automobiles and timeshares. Can we all say amen, right? But there was also comments like this. A 2020 day planner, all right? Pretty useless. One of my buddies, a young man who's now in ministry said, I purchased a brand new 2002 Ford Ranger while being a full-time college student and only having a part-time job. Within a year, he had to turn it back in. Another friend of mine named Nathan was working as a teenager saving his money mowing yards and he saw an advertisement on television for water walkers. And so he purchased his water walkers and actually put them together and actually thought he was gonna be able to walk on water and of course nothing happened. And he wrote, I'm getting mad just thinking about it as I type this, it was such a ripoff. My friend Jessica from my last church said that her husband went out and while she was pregnant, listen, pregnant with her third child, she was a nurse He was a police officer and their schedules rotated. They were never on the same work schedule. And they had no family to watch their two kids that were were there and she's, remember, pregnant with a third child. He goes out and buys two used jet skis (laughs) that they were hardly able to use. Jason, who's a pastor friend, says, I bought 100 plastic wine glasses 
because it was a good deal. But keep in mind, we rarely host parties and we don't drink wine, all right? <laughs> Kelly uh, purchased a portable air conditioner that was neither portable nor a very good air conditioner. My friend Steve bought a $1,000 air conditioned and heated doghouse for his dog that his dog refused to get into, so he had to sell it for $100. There's a story of an inflatable jacuzzi, a $400 um, uh, monogrammed ink pen with the name in gold that was never used. Jana said, when we first got married, we bought this beautiful white couch. We then adopted two dogs, and now we have three kids, and the white couch is brown. Elizabeth said, I bought leg warmers for my cat. And I said to her, there's no way you did that. She said, yes, I did. I said, I don't believe you. She sent me a picture. Look at this picture. See, we have this picture. She literally has leg warmers for a cat. I told her, I said, you're right, Elizabeth. That's pretty dumb, so. All of us have our stories of foolish purchases. Whether it was a purchase that was just spontaneous and out of the box, or whether it was something that we just had our mind set on, we've all made foolish purchases. But God said to Jeremiah, I'm asking you to do something. And I'm asking you to do something, Jeremiah, that you know in your own mind is utterly ridiculous. And everybody around you knows it's utterly ridiculous. But Jeremiah nonetheless obeyed the Lord. The story is found in chapter number 32 of Jeremiah. And if you have a Bible, you can turn to chapter 32 as we sort of walk through this passage today. Beginning in verse number one, this is is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord on the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, while uh, was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was confined to the courtyard of the guard of the royal palace of Judah. Now Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had imprisoned him there, saying, why do you prophesy as you do? Because Jeremiah kept prophesying and saying to the people, uh, if you do not repent, God is going to bring judgment. If you do not repent, the Babylonians are going to sweep through and they're going to take over Jerusalem and they are going to level the city. It's going to be wiped out. And the false prophets kept telling the people, don't listen to that. God is going to deliver us just as he did in the days of Hezekiah when the Assyrians were on the doorstep. God is going to save us again. You have nothing to repent of and nothing to worry about. But Jeremiah and a few other prophets says, no, no, those are false prophets. Listen to the word of the Lord. And so Zedekiah, the king, takes Jeremiah and puts him under house arrest. He confines him to the courtyard so he cannot talk to the people. So Jeremiah is confined and in jail, house arrest. And then it says in verse number two that the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. The Babylonians, which has this massive army, they were the world power at this time. They have surrounded Jerusalem with all of their armies, and the people are are sweating bullets. They know this is not looking good. So the city is about ready to be sacked and ravished by the Babylonians. Jeremiah is in the courtyard, and then it says this in verse number six. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shemala, your, uh, uh, Shalem, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field in Anathoth because its nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Then, just as the Lord had said this, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it and buy it for yourself. So, Hanamel can read the sign of the times. He knows I've got this beachfront property in Arizona. And so Jeremiah, this is your right and your responsibility and knowing that you're a spiritual guy, this is sort of your duty to buy this property because you're part of the family. So I wanna unload this beachfront property to you. And then once I get my money, Hannah Hannah Mel probably thinks, well, I'm gonna get my money and I'm gonna get out of here before these Babylonians ravish everything. Notice what it says next. I knew that this 
was the word of the Lord. Part of the thing that I love about the book of Jeremiah is how personal it is, how authentic it is, how transparent it is. I, I, I entitled this series Exile and Hope, but I almost entitled it It's Personal because Jeremiah, so much of this we see in, into Jeremiah's life more than any other prophet in the Bible, we see into Jeremiah's inner life. And I love the reality here. I knew it was the word of the Lord because just like you and I, sometimes even the prophets of old had to discern at times, what is God saying? And I'm quite sure that when Jeremiah first, the word of the Lord came to him and says, Hannah and I, you're gonna have a relative come to you and try to sell you a piece of land that's about to be useless. And then next thing you know, he shows up right there at his doorstep. And Jeremiah says, this is not a coincidence. This is the word of the Lord. God is speaking to me. God is doing something. So it says in verse number nine, I bought the field at Anathoth. That in and of itself, my friends, is enough. If we just take that one phrase and you meditate on it and you think about it, so I bought a field, the field at Anathoth. That, my friends, is enough for us to meditate on and think about. Jeremiah heard the voice of the Lord. He knew it was God, and so he just obeyed. So I bought the field of Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver. I signed and I sealed the deed. I had it witnessed and I weighed out the silver on the scales. Everything is being done properly. As if it matters in about two weeks after the Babylonians are done with the city of Jerusalem. But Jeremiah is so thorough to obey God here, he's, he's following the letter of the law. He's doing everything proper. I signed the document or the deed was sealed. I had it purchased. I weighed out the silver on the scale so it was exactly 17 shekels. Now remember, there's about ready to be a severe climate here. And you know what? I'm quite sure that most people were trying to get their savings out. Like Hanamel, they're trying to get their money together, anticipating the city being ravished, and either they're either trying to get out of town or they're trying to gather what they have so when they are taken away, they have something with them because they're not gonna have any possessions left. Jeremiah obeys the Lord and he takes 17 shekels of silver. He takes his money, part of his security, and he gives it over to buy this land. In verse number 11, I took the deed of purchase, sealed copy containing the terms and conditions as well as the unsealed copy. Notice how thorough this is. And then I gave this deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah. We'll talk about him later in a, in a following message. The son of Nahesa. And in the presence of my cousin Hanamel and of the witnesses who had signed the deed and all of the Jews say in the courtyard, he takes the deed. So Jeremiah here, he does everything as he's supposed to do. He gathers all of it together. He puts it, and then it says in verse 13 through 16, in their presence I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, take these documents, both sealed and unsealed, copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. Why last a long time? How long did Jeremiah tell the people they were gonna be in captivity before they began to come back? Seven decades. So Jeremiah is not only in jail, the Babylonians are about ready to ravish and completely torch the whole thing. He takes money, 17 shekels of silver, at a time that he's probably about ready to be, you know, there's gonna be poverty and death and starving and a lack of food, and he takes 17 shekels of silver, knowing that he's not a rich guy. And then, on top of all these things, um, he says, take these copies and put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. Here's, the, here's the, the final piece of the puzzle. Jeremiah acknowledges, I'm not gonna live long enough to see this thing play itself out. Jeremiah says, get clay jars, they're gonna last a long time. And Jeremiah knows, Jeremiah's already been a prophet for over three decades, almost four decades at this time. He knows his days are numbered. So he buys the land and he's never ever going to have the opportunity to flip it and to make money on it. He's never going to see the redemption of the land of Israel. 
He's never going to see the promise of God fulfilled. If you watched last week, we talked about this. Sometimes God gives us promises that we don't always see their fulfillment in this lifetime. But nonetheless, we are called to walk by faith, to trust that those things are true, even when our reality does not feel and seem like they are true. This is what the Lord Almighty in verse 16 says. Put them in a, in, a, in a clay jar that will last a long time. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The God of Israel, houses, fields, vineyards will again be brought in this land. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, I prayed to the Lord. In other words, the Lord asked Jeremiah to do something that is a living example, a living illustration of the promise that God was giving the Israelites. Not just is Jeremiah to use words, but God says, Jeremiah, I want you to do this tangible action because it is symbolic. It is representative of what's gonna happen. You're buying a piece of land that is about to be worth nothing, but one day it's going to be valuable. One day it's gonna mean something again, even though you're not gonna see it. This is why chapter 32 is buried in the middle of chapter 29 and 30 and 31 and 33 where we have all these chapters of hope, all these chapters of redemption, all these chapters of renewal of the nation of Israel and in the middle of it, God gives an entire chapter of this whole dialogue with Jeremiah and Jeremiah buying a piece of land and Anathoth. It is meant to be an illustration, an example, a model, a tangible story for the people to look at and say, wow, Jeremiah really believes what he's saying. Because here's the thing. They didn't want to believe Jeremiah when he told them for three decades that the Babylonians were going to overtake the city. Now, Jeremiah looks like he's right. But remember what happened once it became inevitable and they began to overrun the city, you remember what the false prophets, once the city was overrun by the Babylonians, remember what the false prophets were telling the people? It's only going to be what? Two years. See, they changed their tune because they were wrong, and then when they were wrong, they changed their story. They said, well, okay, we've been overcome, but it's only going to be two years. Jeremiah says, no, 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 you're, you're totally wrong. It's going to be 70 years. So Jeremiah obeys the Lord and he buys the land. This becomes a tangible, visible illustration of what God is going to do for the nation of Israel. It's meant to be a story that people can see. And why did Jeremiah do everything proper to the letter of the law? Why did he do it in front of witnesses? Because Jeremiah wanted word to get out because God wanted to show the people this is a tangible message of what's gonna happen. Once again, the Lord says, houses and fields and vineyards will again be brought in this land. But as I read this story, it's not just the illustration of what God told Jeremiah to do, but to me, it's the application. It's the fact that once again, we see behind the curtain and we see into Jeremiah's heart and life and we see this guy that has endured persecution, this guy who prayed in a way that we talked about in chapter 20, that we've seen very few people in the Bible pray with the kind of raw emotion and transparency that Jeremiah does. We see his questions and we see his doubts and we see his frustrations and we see his faith and we see his boldness and we see his perseverance. And here, once again, we see Jeremiah's obedience. Just as earlier, God had called Jeremiah to go to the potter's house and to use that as an illustration. And then as God told Jeremiah to break a piece of pottery as an illustration of what's going to happen to the nation of Israel, to Jerusalem, it's going to be broken and shattered and not be able to be put back together. And then he told him to buy a linen belt and that was also an illustration. Now God says, Jeremiah, I've got one more thing for you to do before the city falls. One more illustration to live out in front of the people. And Jeremiah obeys. Once again, I love the phrase, so I bought the field at Anathoth. I bought the field at Anathoth. I obeyed. And notice that Jeremiah didn't, didn't take time to wrestle with it. He didn't say, you know, I didn't need to think this through and God, is this really you? And, and but what about this? And how long is it gonna take? And am I gonna get my money back? And are you gonna provide for me? If I spend the 17 shekels of silver, God, can you give me some assurance that you're gonna be able to give me money to live off of when the city falls? Jeremiah doesn't, doesn't f- 
fall into that trap that we do. Jeremiah, when he knew that God was speaking, remember what it says? I knew that this was the word of the Lord and Jeremiah immediately acted on it. He immediately obeyed. One of the weaknesses that we all struggle with as individuals and one of the weaknesses that I see in the church today is that we love to talk about what we believe. We love to talk about our faith. We love love to talk about our convictions. We love to talk about what we think God wants for ourselves, for our nation, for our land, for the church. But the most powerful and the most life-changing lessons are not taught, they are caught. They are not just heard, but they are seen. Jesus could not have been more specific when he talked about things like this. Take up your cross, die to yourself, and follow me. If you want to find your life, said Jesus, you must be willing to lose it. Then in response to the question, what's the greatest of all the commandments, Jesus said this, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That, he said, summarizes everything. It's the top of the line. If you want to know how to live your life, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't do unto others as they've done to you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Apostle Paul says that we can allow our bodies to be burned as martyrs, but if we have not love, it's useless. We can prophesy and preach and teach and say all these right things, but if we have not love, we are a clanging gong and a banging cymbal. The greatest of these, says Paul, is faith, hope, and love, but love, one another, is the greatest. Galatians says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love, not passion, not anger, not truth, but faith expressing itself in love. Paul said that he would gladly limit his freedom, lay down his life for the sake of other people. Paul said, my rights are worth nothing. In all humility, Paul said, consider others greater than yourself. The Apostle Paul's, Apostle John said in 1 John, he said, love not in speech, in word, but in deed and in truth. The practice of grace and love and forgiveness and selflessness, these are core foundational. It's Christianity 101. And while words and beliefs are very, very important, at the end of the day, it's not what we say, it's what we do. And God will bring us into these transitional moments, these these moments, these fault lines where we have to be able to decide, am I going to obey or am I not? Because believing the right things is not hard to do. And saying the right things is even easier. But as it says in the book of James, faith without deeds is dead. And sometimes God calls us into situations where we must be able to act on what we believe, where we are called to act in a way that goes against our flesh. God calls us to do something that doesn't make sense, something that may be perceived as foolish or irrational. God will ask us to do something like buy a field and Anathoth. This week I had a meeting with a pastor friend in the valley who I respect greatly, he has begun to reopen his church and he had a member of his church that came to him that he is personal friends with. And he said to him, if you're asking people to wear masks, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming back as long as you tell people they need to wear a mask to come to church. And not only that, I am not gonna give a dime to the church until you allow people to come however they wanna come because no one is telling me what to do. This young man loves the Lord. This young man would tell you that he believes that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of his sins and rose again. This young man will tell you he believes the Bible is the inspired word of God. But his flesh is so alive inside of him that he is disregarding the basic tenets of Christ about about dying to ourselves and, and loving others and it's not about you. Jeremiah was at a place where God says, Jeremiah, you've, listen, think about all that Jeremiah has done to this point. 
all the obedience, the persecution he's overcome, the rejection, all the things he's gone through. And now, now that Jeremiah probably is sitting there and maybe, I don't know for sure, but maybe Jeremiah had a little sense of self-justification as everyone's panicking and the, the, the Babylonians are around the wall and Jeremiah is about to say, you know what, I've been saying this for 30 some years, they won't listen to a word I said and you know what, I'm about to be vindicated. <laughs> and just about the time that Jeremiah is able to sit back and rest on his laurels, God says, now Jeremiah, I want you to buy a field in Anathoth. Because following God never ends. And what God may ask us to do as long as God speaks and as long as we listen and we follow, God may ask us to do things up into our last breath that may make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. May ask us to do things that we simply do not want to do. The flesh rages inside of all of us. Paul says in Galatians chapter five that there was a flesh and a spirit battle. There are things that we want to do. We want control. We want, what, we want the world to be the way we want the world to be. We want our lives to be easy and smooth and we want security. And we want these things and not all of those things that we want are bad. But when God calls us to follow the spirit, sometimes it means that we must do things. We must act in ways that are counter intuitive and in some cases things that make us feel very very out of control and uncomfortable jeremiah when god spoke bought a field and anathoth a few days ago i saw an interview with a woman named julia jackson she's the mother of jacob blake the young man that was shot seven times in the back in wisconsin You've probably seen a lot of news stories, a lot of debates about what's justified and what's not justified, and if this guy just would have ordered, never would have happened, and this is too much of a pattern, all these things. My concern is not to talk about justification or not justification, because I saw an interview with her, and here's a mother whose child is in the hospital fighting for his life, shot seven times in the back. She gets, appears before the television cameras, and she's got tears in her face. You can see the fatigue on her face as she speaks to reporters. But as she spoke, there was no vitriol in her voice. There was no anger. There was brokenness and sadness and concern. But she stood before microphones. And you know what? Many people haven't seen this because our media doesn't cover stories like this as much as they do other stories. But Julia Jackson stands before the microphone and she says, I plead for the violence and the destruction to stop. She pleads with every American listening to her voice to examine our hearts. She said, I am praying for healing for our country. She spoke into the camera and said, those of you who serve on the police force, I want you to know I'm praying for you. When she went to the hospital to visit her son, there was a police officer outside the door and she embraced him and prayed with him at the hospital. She said, we must work together. And while she is upset and concerned about her son, she said, I want everyone to know that I have forgiven this man who shot my son and I want to see us become more unified. Julia Jackson is a believer in Jesus Christ. And with so much emotion and pain in her life, I saw a woman stand before the counters and speak, to speak in the ways of the Spirit when everyone around her and everything around us is trying to speak in the flesh. Jeremiah was an amazing prophet. His ministry extended over four decades long and the book of the Bible that's named after him, I've said to you, is the longest book in the Bible. Not chapter-wise, but number-wise, or by letter-wise and uh, word-wise, it's the longest book in the Bible. But more than all the words that Jeremiah wrote, and all the words that Jeremiah spoke, what ultimately spoke the loudest was his actions. Over and over again, it was his actions. And what was true then is true today. May God give you and I the grace, the grace to hear his voice 
And when the Lord tells us to do what we do not want to do, for Jeremiah, it was to buy a field in Anathoth. But for some of us, it may be forgiving someone we don't want to forgive or giving generously to something that we don't want to give generously to or acknowledging a problem that we don't want to acknowledge. Or for some of us, it may simply be saying something as deep as, I'm sorry, or it was my fault. Our flesh and our spirit will rage against each other. But may God give us the same grace he gave Jeremiah. And when push comes to shove, may we have the courage to obey. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are God and the promises that you gave the Israelites. And I thank you for the incredible example of faith that we see in Jeremiah. And Lord, we live our own lives with decisions and choices and frustrations and anger and questions and concerns. And inside of every one of us, the same flesh and spirit battle rages. And I pray, dear God, that you give us the grace to obey when you ask us to do those things that go against our human nature. And when we do, Lord, may you be glorified. And even if we don't see the outcomes, just as Jeremiah did not see the outcome of the land, may you be glorified and may you work for a greater good in this world that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.